Okay, good morning. Um, we are um, here today, this morning, and I want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, we are hosting the um, Greater San Joaquin County Region Integrated Regional Water Management first ever H2O boot camp. And um, also it is hosted by the Greater San Joaquin County Regional Water Coordinating Committee. And quiero darles la bienvenida. Hoy en la mañana estamos aquí y estamos este para una presentación que se va a llevar a cabo con este el condado de San Joaquin de la región de mayor de San Joaquin y con el Comité de Coordinación Regional de Agua del Condado de San Joaquín. Y se va a tomar a cabo un taller con varios este, presentadores este, que son de diferentes partes del estado. So today, this morning, who we have with us is um, the various speakers that we have invited and again thank you to all the panelists who have agreed to come and join us and give our the presentation to our community of the greater san joaquin region so this morning we have connor everts who will speak about the um politics of water how water moves and how people move water Connor is the executive director of the Southern California Watershed Alliance, the co-chair of the DSAL response group, and he's also the facilitator of the Environmental Water Caucus. He is um, chair of public officials for water and environmental reform power, as well as other organizations. Connor is very well versed in water. He is, um, has headed up various organizations in Southern California and has a uh, stellar bio, which you all can also access through the um, through the the calendar invite on the webinar. Connor, Connor is representante del del sur de California y es director ejecutivo de um, la Alianza y también es, de, es este parte de um, diferentes grupos en donde él ha dirigido acerca del agua por varios años y te, tenemos su resumen también por medio del internet. And then at 10.30, we're going to have Marta Camacho Rodriguez. And Marta is um, going to speak about going from an activist to a water board director. And Marta is currently the on the Central Basin Board as one of the directors, and she represents the cities of Bell Gardens, Downey, Montebello, Pico Rivera, West Whittier, Los Nietos, and unincorporated areas of Los Angeles. Marta Camacho Rodriguez es directora que es está ahorita sirviendo por parte de la mesa directiva de Central Basin. Y ella representa las ciudades de Bell Gardens, Downey, Montebello, Pico Rivera, West Whittier, Los Nietos, y áreas inincorporadas del condado de Los Ángeles. Uh, besides serving on the board, she also represents District 1 for Cerritos College Board of Trustees. And she's very involved with a lot of grassroots organizations. Marta también representa al Colegio de Cerritos um, College, el Colegio Comunitario en el Distrito 1, y también está envuelta en muchas organizaciones este, por parte del sur este de Los Ángeles. At 10.45, we'll have Leticia Corona. Leticia is going to talk about the importance of community work as it relates to funding. Leticia is a Global Development and Population Fellow at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. She works across the program's portfolio to provide strategic and analytic input. Before joining the foundation, she was the Director of Community and Advocacy at Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability <clears throat> in Fresno, California. She's worked with the U.S.-Mexico Border Philanthropy Partnership 
and has many accolades working within the marginalized communities and with women of color. Leticia, ahorita ella representa William y Flora Hewlett Foundation y ella trabaja con muchas estrategias y ella trabaja en la fundación de organizar diferentes este, servicios de salud para que puedan tener acceso a las personas en los Estados Unidos. <coughs> Soy directora de um, el Leadership Council en, en la ciudad de Fresno, California. También ha hecho mucho trabajo en um, los Estados Unidos y México desarrollando diferentes asociaciones y también este, sirve como guiar a mujeres latinas y mujeres de color en el Valle Central. También tenemos más información directo de Leticia en, en el internet. Y siguiente, next is Dr. Federico Castillo. And Dr. Castillo will speak on the principles of environmental justice at 11 o'clock. And, and Dr. Castillo is an environmental agricultural economist with PhD in undergraduate studies from the University of California. Federico's research is centered on technology transfer and innovation, economic valuation, the socioeconomic impacts of climate change, the economic aspects of protected areas and migration. And Dr. Castillo has taught courses related in the migration to the United States, natural resource economics, economics of climate change, and sustainable business practices. El doctor Federico Castillo es agricultor de medio ambiente, economista con un doctorado y también recibido de, um, de la Universidad de California de Berkeley. Y hace este um, de tecnología, este innovación de economía, impactos de clima, es parte de los estudios del doctor Castillo. Y ha hecho también este cursos cerca este, de la migración en los Estados Unidos y también acerca del clima y también de um, negocios sostenibles. Next, after, we will have Andrea León Grossman. And Andrea León Gross, Grossman will speak as to how advocating leads the way for coastal justice in California's Ocean Day Latinos Marinos. Andrea serves as the Deputy Director of Azul in Los Angeles. Prior to the position there, she worked as an organizer with Food and Water Watch as the lead of their 100% renewable energy campaign in Los Angeles. And she brings experience and a proven track record in organizing an environmental arena. Andrea Leon Grossman va a hablar acerca de los Um, principios de cómo este, organizar a los latinos y lo que han hecho con latinos marinos este, con el estado de California. Ella trabaja como directora este, en el, el programa de Azul en Los Ángeles y antes trabajaba con la organización de Food and Water Watch este, y tiene mucha experiencia en trabajar en diferentes aspectos del medio ambiente. And then finally, we will have a video with John Holbrook. And John Holbrook is the chair of the Greater San Joaquin County Regional Coordinating Committee. Vamos a tener un video para la última persona que va a presentar que va a ser John Holbrook. Y él es el director del Comité de Coordinación del Condado de San Joaquin. Y ese va a ser un video. Entonces, so if, just to, to clarify in English, John will not be on the panel in person. He is going to be via video. So next, if we can have um, Connor Everts is who I'd like to introduce first. Good morning. Um, thank you, SG, and I appreciate this opportunity. Um, I guess I can call myself the old man of water at this point. Um, I've been working on it for over 40 years. Um, it was a personal preference initially. Um, I loved uh, 
jumping in any body of water I could see and fishing, but then I got interested in the policy level. Do you want to translate? Este, yo, Connor Everts, pueden decir que soy la persona mayor de agua porque he estado trabajando en agua en diferentes aspectos y este, um, y he empezado mi carrera de, de, de hace much, muchísimos años. Yeah. So, el proto, patrón de agua, as, as you would call me. So, I'm going to talk about how um, people move water and how water works in general in California and a little bit about my experience as an example of um, how people can get involved. Um, so his historically, um, water uh, came out of the ground, flowed naturally in rivers and sustained a much smaller native population in the state. Um, once people ar started arriving, Europeans in large numbers they began damming, diverting, and creating um, canals and eventually dams and large aqueducts, which we now know as this plumbing system that moves water um, across California, usually from north to south. Um, in Southern California, we also get water from the east, from the Colorado River system. Um, that's allowed populations along the coast to expand beyond what their natural water systems would have sustained. We're now at the point where we're looking at how can we undo some of those systems, take down dams, restore natural flows to rivers, and sustain on more local water, which I'll talk about a little bit briefly, um, even here in Southern California. So in, in my time working on this issue, um, I helped start the organization, it's a, co-sponsor here, the Environmental Justice Coalition for Water. Um, we saw the need because we were looking at a giant uh, plumbing project coming out of the Delta that would have brought water um, to Southern California, maybe, but really would have just brought water to um, Big Ag across much of the Southern San Joaquin, some of the driest areas. Um, in the, the next big element that also comes into this is the amount of energy it takes to move water. So 19% of all the electrical energy in the state is to pump, treat, and transfer water across the state. Many of the big systems run essentially on gravity, um, but then we have mountain ranges uh, like the Tehachapi's when you drive on the five, you're running along the LA, um, the State Water Project Aqueduct, it needs to be pumped over in a huge lift, a huge amount of energy. Single biggest use of electrical energy in the state is pumping that water. So we have embedded energy in, it, in our water as well, and anything we can do off, to offset that is a positive. At the same time, we've changed not only the ecosystems, but the social systems by moving water out of areas where it occurred naturally, often leaving people without access to clean drinking water as um, clear water, snow melt water will flow right past them. And they often have to rely on polluted groundwater, both in agricultural areas, in the Central Valley, Salinas Valley, and in urban areas in Southern California and Southeast LA that still rely primarily on local groundwater. So, the amount of energy, the amount of water that we move in this state is massive. It depends on these huge plumbing systems. Um, and yet at the same time, the other element in all this that people um, don't talk about much is that since 1978, the population's increased across the state. We have actually um, lowered our amount of water with increase of population. In Los Angeles in particular, 1.4 million more people. Our water demand was flat until our mandatory conservation during the extreme drought in 2013 through 2016. Um, and at that point, we actually dropped it about another 19%. So population doesn't automatically mean that we need more water in this state. We use more water per capita than many places in the world. Um, we use about 174 gallons per day per person 
across the state, including all uses of water. Um, and then we uh, you compare that to places like Australia that had a 12 year drought, Spain and Israel that are dry, but relatively the same um, lifestyle. Um, they use about 30 to 50 gallons per day per person. So that's part of the inequity we have in water and that we're using huge amounts in certain coastal areas, primarily for uh, landscaping and exotic use, about 70% is outdoor water usage in those points. The other question about water um, that kind of has always amazed me was the first time um, a staffer from Environmental Justice Coalition came down to Southern California. I've been spending my time driving up and helping organize in Sacramento and Oakland and then going out to local communities. But we came down because we'd gotten a phone call, a small town named Maywood, which is unfortunately the poster child for polluted water, um, had a legacy of both industrial waste. They had three private water mutual companies were left over from an ag era. They had dense population in uh, less than one square mile and three of these private companies where you have to be a landlord to have a vote which is still the case in many irrigation areas. So we went down there, we met with the local activists, they showed us bottles of brown water. We went to a hearing uh, where federal EPA was there and other agencies and they, one of the local mutuals said, so what, it's just brown water for brown people. At that point I stood up and said, we're gonna put you out of business, I don't take care how long it takes. But just to show um, how water moves quickly and people move slowly, it's been a long institutional battle that isn't over there yet. We are uh, slowly beginning to clean up water, but um, it doesn't happen quickly because there are thousands of water agencies in the state, each with their own elected boards, each with their own staff. Some of them represent direct democracy, and we'll hear about that later, but others don't and others um, aren't prepared for uh, what's happening now, which is a real, I think in the last 10 or 12 years, people become aware of water as an issue. They've gotten involved, they show up. Um, now we have to do it through Zoom meetings, but um, we can uh, flood the Zoom uh, virtual meetings with people who are concerned about rate increases, people who are concerned during these times, especially um, with being cut off, um, all these issues have come to the forefront. The affordability of water, not only in terms of quality, because some people are buying water multiple times, they're paying for water that they can't use because it's not clean. They're going out and buying water and a bottle rate, you're paying over a million dollars for what we talk about as anchor foot, which is over, uh, it's about 250,000 gallons of water. Um, and then they're, um, if there's property tax, either of their own or through rent, um, they're paying through property tax as well. So water ends up being far more expensive than it seems when they just calculate it at the tap. So I will hope that we, um, you have an excellent lineup of people here. Um, I'm, I, I'm gonna not talk about um, some of my most passionate issue, which, which is bringing down dams. Um, fighting ocean desalination or um, these big conveyance systems that with SB and Andrea and others I worked against for many years. In the end, we don't see these big structural projects happen. We spend a lot of time and effort on them. Ocean desalination is certainly an example. In the 30 years that I've worked on it, they've only built one large scale plant and that has a lot of problems. Um, we, we want to really talk about how we reduce our water. And there's some agencies in Southern California that are taking up responsibility for that. I live in Santa Monica. We're getting off imported water and maximizing our local water, cleaning up our groundwater and increasing our efficiency to the point we won't need any imported water any longer. That also increases our climate change um, goals and sustainability. At the same time, every agency should have the ability to do that and make that a focus. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say, I think the most important thing I've learned through uh, working in water 
is the relationships you build with people. At this point, I'm, I guess I'm a mentor to some, but I learn from others. But the relationships through time that I have with working with people who've ended up in various positions, you know, whether they've gone to work for the legislature, whether they've come back and work for nonprofits, whether they've um, gone on to law school and become water attorneys, um, whether they become scientists, um, are, are really key. And, and I also think um, I was elected to a water district. I was young at the time. I didn't know quite what was involved, but I wanted the opportunity. And um, I think it's an experience and an opportunity everyone should take. And lastly, I would say um, you can also have some fun doing this work. Um, the, it's, the, the fun was a little hard work, but we scoop water out of the uh, reflecting pool at the Department of Water and Power, 100 people, um, put in test tubes for the, um, it was for the community-based organizations that did a major portion of the water savings in Los Angeles and that were the delivery mechanism, groups like Mothers of East LA. And six days later, across the Mojave Desert, up through the climbs of the mountains in the Eastern Sierra, we put it back into Mono Lake, where some water was being diverted to the streams and the rest was offset by saving water through conservation programs with community groups in Los Angeles. Uh, that was an epic and fun, fun trip. Um, the other one we did was to establish that um, the rivers in the Southwest are navigable, meaning you can run a boat down them and the clean water will um, apply. We actually put kayaks and canoes in the LA River. Um, there are parts of the LA River that the water table is so high it's broken and the, the trees have grown and there's aquatic plants and there's open space. The rest of it though is a hard concrete channel meant for flood control. And so it wasn't really good paddling, but we managed to do it. They actually made a documentary of it called uh, Rock the Boat. Um, and I'd leave you if you haven't seen Environmental Justice's uh, documentary called Thirsty for Justice, talks about sanitation issues as well. Our book, part of which is in Spanish, um, Thirsty for Justice also. And uh, it's a great opportunity. It's kind of an historical moment for an organization that's been around for over 20 years. Thank you very much. And I didn't stop, Espy, so you're gonna have to fill in. <laughs> no, thank you, Connor. What we were gonna do is in order to, um, to make sure that we have like the time and, and um, and we have folks asking questions, what have you. Um, first and foremost, the, the questions we will be answering at the end of the presentations, so that that way we can see because there may be multiple questions, um, and then if they're going to be asked of the panelists, so we will be answering the questions at the end. And um, and what will what we are going to do? So for all of the panelists, previously we were going to do the translation. So since we currently do not have a request for the translation, we're going to go ahead and do all of your translations and have them um, posted on the website after the, um, the presentation. So once they go on live onto the county's website, we will have all of your presentations translated. So for all the other panelists, we can go ahead and make your presentations in English and um, and we will have the, the Spanish translation done at afterwards when it's posted onto the website for anyone who wants access for Spanish speaking. Cool. Again, thank you. And so next we have Marta Camacho Rodriguez. Good morning, buenos dias. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of history. So I'll talk a little bit about myself. Um, I'm honored and glad to hear that um, I have someone from my hometown that is also speaking today. So um, I was born and raised in Fresno, California. I was actually born in a little town called Fowler, which is maybe like a, a two by four little stretch of a town uh, surrounded by grapes and agriculture. And I consider myself um, a climate refugee from Fresno to LA. So my escape from Fresno, you know, my children were very young, suffering from, you know, extreme um, 
forms of asthma, allergies. I think uh, of the 250 allergy tests they took, they were pretty much positive for a majority of them. Um, so I come with, um, I think, an eye view of what social injustices look like when it comes to air, water, and soil. And my experience with living through um, what a lot of our political agenda does to harm people instead of helping us. So um, growing up uh, in an agricultural area, uh, Fresno, you know, to the northeast, southwest, you can hit agriculture in any direction. It's also a small town that mimics big city style in some, some areas. Um, how I ended up in Los Angeles is as a school teacher in Fresno, um, with my summers off, we would come and escape to LA where we have family. And we just noticed that when we stayed here, our, my children's symptoms would ease up. And then as always, you know, um, the sun, the sunny weather 24 seven is also a big plus. Um, and for us, that was kind of like what drew us to stay here. So um, in this whole time that I've been here, um, one of the things that I noticed is that uh, no matter where you go, um, we will always be uh, encountering air, water, soil issues. And no matter where you go, you also find that we are in the middle of you know, political battles because water, like anything else, um, appears to almost mimic that narco style where, you know, people are fighting, you know, we have regions that are fighting against each other and they turn out to be these water factions that are, you know, positive for the community uh, in some respects. And that would be the people like us that are fighting for our right to access clean, safe, affordable drinking water. And then we have people who write policy and laws and make these uh, policy in laws considering our needs. And so it's really like this huge battle and it seems like it's a 24 seven job. Um, it's a thankless job, but for those of us that enjoy battling for our communities, it's something that is just um, second nature to us. And so um, as a school teacher in Compton, um, watching yellow water come out of our uh, faucet in the teacher lounge and then having children just you know we don't drink you know fountain water um, well when you see why children and people would refuse to drink colored yellow water from you know yellow to different shades of brown um, we have to acknowledge that there's a psychology of water and nobody would consider drink, drinking tainted looking water and so it's not something that we readily accept um, on any level and so for us it's real important to keep in mind that we also assume because the water is clear it looks uh, it looks safe it doesn't smell and so we assume that it's safe to drink and that's not always the case so I um, currently reside in Downey, California, and it's one of the cities that I represent um, of the district that I represent, but in total, there are 24 cities. But in particular, the region that I represent, there are over 30 contaminated wells of PFOS. And so there are 60 in the region of Los Angeles, uh, 300 in California that are worse than Flint, Michigan. And I'm not exaggerating that they are worse. Uh, these are because they're documented in what, what amount of contamination they have. So it's important for us to acknowledge that we have serious issues with our water and we also have serious contamination and air water soil throughout heavily populated areas of our latino and black and brown communities that uh, we reside in and a lot of times we see that our political power the people that represent us don't represent us and they don't represent us because at times they'd be more willing to cater to the individuals that 
donate to their campaigns that keep them Eric, in that seat. Sid, and so um, at the end, you guys, I'm sorry about the noise. The we're, fall, we're doing a drive-through graduation for my Eric youngest boy. Attending. So we're currently in the parking lot of Bourbon Day High School. So excuse me, you know, with all the noise um, back here. Um, That's okay. So in, in um, the political arena of how we consider you know, the democracy of water, we're seeing very clearly that water is life and it mimics as an individual such as ourselves, such as ourselves as a group. And we see how limited those of us, uh, especially people of color, are um, being put in situations where we don't have rights and our water does not have rights because they don't care to clean our water. They don't care to de decontaminate Patrick, our water. And they don't care that we are dying slowly because of this contamination. And unfortunately, some people are dying very quickly. And um, right now I find myself in the middle of a battle where um, I'm having to fight with 80 assembly members and 40 senators because they want to pass a bill to dissolve uh, the basin that I represent. And so um, for us, having a voice uh, and to exert our voice comes in a vote. And so we need to be very aware of who and, who and what we're voting for and be conscientious. Um, you know, as as a voter, we go ahead and um, take the responsibility to elect an individual or to choose a measure or to choose a law by a vote if we have that control. And so when we conscientiously think, okay, how is this going to benefit me and everyone who I sit with? Um, those are things that we always have to ask ourselves when we um, vote. And so um, getting back to how I got here. So as a teacher watching my community of students, um, you know, being poisoned by manganese water that was, that was just at a very high level, um, we saw that it wasn't till social media blew up these, you know, continuous rounds of videos of people showing their water, you know, uh, from their kitchen, from, you know, their restroom when they're brushing their teeth, from their washing machines when they're washing their clothes. You know, we don't realize how impactful those images are. And many people are, are really removed from what that means. And they're removed from what that means because if they don't experience the psychology of dirty water, then they don't understand the impact. But what I'm trying to make um, as a point to everyone is don't assume that because the obvious of dirty water is right in front of you, that your water is clean. And so at the end of the day, going back to my community, um, I live in a district with 30 contaminated wells of PFOS. And one of our fights has been that we give connections to these cities, to these water companies, so that their customers can have access to clean water that is provided through MET. And so what we found is that a lot of the private water companies, the purveyors, and cities as well, because cities have sometimes access to their own water. And we have found that instead of wanting to do the right thing with um, getting these connections, they would rather fight the purpose of Central Basin and choose to dissolve it. Like, you know, to literally put on paper lies so that someone in the Senate and somebody in the Assembly can put this as a bill across uh, their floor and vote to dissolve an agency, to dissolve the democracy of, you know, these and Martha. Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. You went off. <laughs> 
Oh, I'm sorry. So I was mentioning about the David and Goliath fall, uh, fight and that at many times we are the Davids in this, in this uh, fight and how it's so important for everyone to continue to be active in the battle of, you know, this clean water war um, or access to water, access to safe, clean, affordable water. Because, um, well, for the obvious, I, don't, I, I think I'm preaching to, to the choir here. We all know the importance of water, but we also need to know the importance of the democracy of water. We need to know the importance of the psychology of water. And we all need to engage with our communities in ways that will make those changes uh, for everyone's you know, um, health, for everybody's you know, best um, access to water. And um, it, it's just one of the, the biggest things that many of us really don't think about. As I mentioned you know, earlier about how if people have uh, clear, non-smelling water, there's an assumption that everything's okay with my water. And so, as I mentioned, um, I live in a region uh, with 30 contaminated PFAS wells, and that's just one of the contaminants. If you go to ewg.org and click on the tap water report, you can type in your zip code. When you find your water company, you can see the quality reports of water. And at least for the region that I live in, in addition to the PFAS, we have um, 16 other cancer-causing contaminants. And what's amazing about these reports is that um, for a long time, they were not accessible. And those are things that we need to look at is like, what is good pu public policy? And what do I need to do to make changes uh, for my community? And so a few things to keep in mind is one, we have to continually keep in touch with the politicians that represent us. Um, right now in our fight against um, these individuals who have crafted this bill called um, SB 625, we have asked them to think about fast tracking a bill for the connections that are necessary to um, have these cities and private water companies have uh, to met so that they can go ahead and provide the community with actually clean water. And um, so those are just uh, a few things that, you know, we are focused on and um, reminding everyone that it's all interconnected you know air water and soil it's a cycle and it's so necessary you know to address because some people as i mentioned strongly believe if their water doesn't smell and if it does and if it's clear that i'm drinking water that you know is is good for me and that's where we have to educate ourselves because a lot of times the diseases that our communities of color exhibit um, and have and experience are really attributed to a lot of the pollutants that we are breathing in through the air, you know, that we are drinking in the water and that we eat, you know, uh, food from the ground. And so when we look at, you know, thyroid problems, uh, female, um, female issues, when we look at, you know, cholesterol in children, high blood pressure in children, you know, certain, um, certain things that we are experiencing. And people have this assumption, it's always a negative assumption. Oh, you know, those black and brown people don't know how to eat. They don't know how to take care of themselves. And then when we look at our air and our water and we see how many contaminants we're exposed to especially from birth and then continue as we develop it's really really a gross injustice it's an assault against our community and i want to say that every politician who doesn't take care of their community and if they're a, a, a politician of color they are basically committing an assault and terrorist acts against us when they know that we're drinking dirty water and they'd rather craft bills in support of private water companies because they're getting paid to do their work and not represent us.
Thank you very much, Martha. It was very, very um, insightful and como siempre. And again, we will have that translation available for everyone um, when it goes live onto the county website. And congratulations on your graduate, también. Um, Thank and you. So, <laughs> and, um, and so then what we are going to do is move forward with our program. And so let me introduce to you next, Leticia Corona. Hola, hola, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. First and foremost, thank you so much Esperanza for um, having me here as a guest speaker, such an honor. Uh, mil gracias, Esperanza es un gran honor estar aquí eh, presentando, no? Entonces, mil gracias por esta oportunidad. Uh, my style for today, I'll go back and forth in translating from English and Spanish. Um, so my presentation, therefore, will be somewhat um, brief um, in regards to the content. However, um, just bear with me as I'm going back and forth in the translation. Mi presentación hoy en día va a ser un poquito más breve eh, porque voy a andar traduciendo entre el español y inglés. Entonces, el contexto quizás no sea tan, tan um, detalloso, pero igual eh, es importante traducir, ¿verdad? Eh, so I'll just get started. My presentation today um, is broken down into um, three main themes that I really want to convey um, in my talking points, which is one, learning to use your voices and, and lived, again, lived is super important, experiences to drive social and, not, and economic changes in your own community. That's the one topic I will discuss. And the second is also in my position, uh, in privilege of um, working for a $10 billion endowment fo private foundation in Silicon Valley, how do I utilize that privilege to create uh, economic and social opportunities for disadvantaged communities? That will be the second topic. And then the third is, of course, um, how do you, when you are in these positions of power, how do you also create a board of directors, I call it board of directors, which is really mentors and uh, a support group to really guide you in the process of driving strategy and implementation to make sure that your solutions that you're creating versus um, funding are actually um, being sustainable. So those are like the three things that I will talk about. Um, voy a hablar sobre tres temas principales. Uno es la importancia de usar tu voz y experiencias propias para crear ese cambio social y económico en tus propias comunidades. El segundo tema en que voy a hablar y discutir un poquito es también igual a um, cómo uh, la, darle prioridad a las comunidades favorecidas en tu estratégica para mover capital. Eh, en mi caso, yo trabajo para una fundación privada eh, que se llama Hewlett en el Valle de Silicon. Entonces, Yo tomo la responsabilidad de utilizar ese privilegio para traer ese cambio y asegurarme que sea sostenible a largo plazo. Y por tercero, el punto que voy a discutir hoy es asegurándonos que podemos crear como una mesa directiva para apoyarnos en esta toma de decisiones, para asegurarnos que podamos tener ese apoyo no sostenible para asegurarnos que estas eh, siendo leyes o fondos sean sostenibles para nuestras comunidades. Um, so those, again, those are the three main points that I'll be um, discussing today. So I thought it was important to kind of bring them up front. Uh, but before going further, I just want to give a little background as well too on um, who I am as um, mentioned in my bio. My name is Leticia Corona and I work for the Hewlett Foundation in, um, in Silicon Valley. However, I am from um, Selma, which is a, a rural um, city in Fresno County. Uh, I'm first generation, come from immigrant parents from Mexico, and I grew up working in the fields. And that really was our drive and motivation to get a higher education, um, precisely to come back to our communities and, and utilize that to create change. So my sisters are lawyers, attorneys. I concentrated on international affairs, 
um, driving economic and political relationships and how do we drive capital to, and how do we utilize capital for those changes? And so we really took that as our initiative and our personal commitment in life. So when I went to UC Berkeley, um, learned a lot in my classes about the importance of um, environmental justice and how our communities are disproportionately impacted by those and how laws and policies also impact that. And then I learned how to use my voice as a student activist on campus to really drive changes um, locally. And then of course, when I went to grad school, I then utilized those experiences to actually talk about and, and um, write about policies uh, binational in Mexico and the US. And now in my work, um, previously be, um, coming to the foundation, um, as mentioned in my bio, I worked for an environmental justice organization, Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability, where I really learned the importance of, again, using my lived experiences, having grown up in a disadvantaged uh, integrated low-income community, the importance of my voice and utilizing my education and my privilege within these spaces to really represent my communities and other um, disadvantaged communities. And that's really what, um, what I've been doing so far. And so when I decided to leave to Silicon Valley um, to work for the foundation, it was with that intention. How do we get in these spaces of power to drive those changes? And how do we use our voices to do so? And when I got into the foundation, I um, started, a, I created a new investment portfolio precisely focused on that and centering um, the experiences and voices of disadvantaged communities, not just in the San Joaquin Valley, but across the US. I also work internationally, um, helping drive some of those initiatives in East and West Africa and Mexico, but for the purpose of this uh, presentation, I'll concentrate on the US. And why that's super important is because there's very few um, minorities in these positions of power. And I think when there's a few of us, we need to come together and really um, support each other and uplift each other and use our experiences to really bring others to these spaces. And that's exactly what I have been doing. Uh, but of course, all centered around the importance of environmental justice and economic justice. And so for me, in my portfolio, what I did is that I saw a problem that there wasn't, there was a huge, um, I should say gap and lack of investments specifically in rural communities. And so I identified that problem. Then I crafted a solution. And for me, it was again, driving capital into these communities and um, philanthropic precisely um, for this case. And, um, and driving that um, or in the implementation phase, um, phase, I needed support from leadership. And so again, the importance of bringing people as your board of um, directors, right? To support you throughout that thinking process. And then of course the implementation phase and really getting buy-in from people on why it's important to center the voices of disadvantaged communities when you're driving capital for social change. Um, especially uh, Marta really laid it out beautifully where there is a lot of um, inequalities uh, where um, our communities don't have access to clean um, water, which is a, a human right, right? And if we're not speaking about that in certain spaces of power, then change is not gonna come. And so that really has been um, the center of my portfolio. But I went further and I centered around young people as there's so much movement happening and changes being driven by our young people, especially in low income communities and rural communities. And so I took that as my drive and my North Star of change um, within the foundation. And that's the portfolio that I've been managing um, as we speak. And so for now, um, I'll just quickly trans, um, transfer over to Spanish, but that's really um, kind of like the takeaways, just the importance of once again, making sure that once you're in these positions of power, whether you're on a board, whether you're working for a private foundation and driving capital, or whether you're an attorney or a community member, it doesn't matter what, what degrees you have or what level of power, uh, we all have the ability to, to utilize our voices to drive change. And again, that was based on my own lived experience of growing up in a rural low-income community, as I mentioned previously, working in the fields alongside my parents. And my sisters and I really have been leading with that social justice lens, right? And, and now as professionals, we still bring that advocacy um, 
um, power, right, and strength to within institutions. And so I'll leave it with that. Um, but I really just encourage uh, for those who are seeking to to create changes and utilize these boards, water boards specifically, um, please reach out, you know, if you all need some support on, on some encouragement, now is the moment to take action and to step in. But of course, remember to reach out to people that have been in these positions so they could support you. Because it's not just about bringing people into these positions, but how do you um, reach out to people for support so you're, um, you're not drained. As many activists, tend, uh, we, we become drained over time. So making sure that you're nourished to continue. So just Rapidito, lo voy a este, traducir, no tengo mucho tiempo, eh, pero igual quería yo de este, compartirles un poquito. Yo vengo de una familia migrante, eh, crecí en Selma, en, que es una comunidad rural, en el condado de Fresno. Eh, trabajé, eh, mis padres originalmente de Guanajuato, de México, y la verdad, este, crecí yo trabajando en el campo con mis papás, donde yo vi mucha pobreza, inacualidad, y yo y mis hermanas, doctoras, abogadas, y en mi caso, yo trabajo en filantropía, moviendo capital a nuestras comunidades desfavorecidas. Utilicé esa experiencia para realmente traer cambio, ¿verdad? Cuando fui a la universidad de UC Berkeley, to, empecé a tomar clases para entender como justicia ambiental, ¿verdad? Empecé a entender que la verdad, eh, nuestras comunidades año detrás de año han sufrido mucho. Y ahora nosotros estamos en posiciones para utilizar, usar nuestra educación como una herramienta para traer ese cambio, lo cual me impulsó para ir y recibir una maestría en relaciones internacionales, lo cual me concentra mucho en desarrollo económico y relaciones binacionales entre México y los Estados Unidos. Y ahí es cuando empecé realmente a ver que yo tenía el poder para traer cambio en mi comunidad y me impulsó para regresar, ¿no? Ah, después de haber trabajado para las Naciones Unidas eh, en Tijuana. Entonces regresé a mi comunidad en Selma. Eh, eh, trabajé para una organización el liderazgo del Consejo de Liderazgo, eh, que es una comunidad, que, con, perdón, una ONG que se concentra en traer cambios sociales y ambientales en lo que es la región del Valle de San Joaquín. Eh, después de eso, la verdad, yo vi un hueco enorme en la falta de inversiones del sector privado y filantropía en traer esos, este capital a nuestras comunidades y apoyar a estas ONGs que estaban creando cambio con activistas, lo cual me impulsó para hacer un cambio, irme a Silicon Valley, eh, para trabajar para una de las fundaciones más, más grandes eh, en el mundo, y entre unas, no la, la más grande, pero entre unas, en el Valle de Silicon, la Fundación Hewlett. Y allí, la verdad, yo tomé mi privilegio y esta posición para traer y cambiar eh, lo que estábamos creando, ¿no? En el sentido que no allí va un portafolio donde realmente, en mi opinión, estaba centrando las necesidades de comunidades desfavorecidas. En mi caso, yo me concentré en jóvenes que realmente están creando cambios sociales al nivel global, ¿verdad? Eh, entonces, eh, me concentré en eso, empecé a desarrollar una estratégica. Eh, la verdad, pude eh, eh, reservar ciertos millones de dólares para esta iniciativa y hasta, hasta ahora este es el portafolio que yo manejo y invierto en las organizaciones que los jóvenes son los líderes en estas organizaciones y más que nada los jóvenes de comunidades minorías rurales, como lo es el Valle de San Joaquín, para asegurarnos que la siguiente generación no puede este, traer ese cambio a sus comunidades. Entonces, lo más importante, más que nada, que quiero rescatar es la importancia de no tener miedo para usar sus voces para traer cambio a sus comunidades. Y recuerden que no están solos. Pueden crear una mesa directiva de gente que los pueden apoyar, asesorar, para que cuando ustedes identifiquen un problema, uh, puedan ustedes también crear esa solución. ¿no? Eh, igual aquí estamos para apoyarlos. Identifiquen a personas que ya han estado en mesas directivas del agua para poder, este, no sé, eh, recibir su guía, ¿verdad? Y asesoría para que ustedes puedan, de este ser exitosos en estas posiciones de poder y traer el cambio necesario a sus comunidades. So yeah, I think um, those were kind of like the main main um, talking points. I know I went really fast. I tend to talk really fast, so I apologize for that. Uh, but I think it's just such an amazing opportunity right now um, for those that are listening, right, to not think of, um, you know, not be afraid. It's basically my, my overarching um, theme is that this is the moment now to act. And no matter who you are, where you work at, 
uh, where you live in, we all can collectively, you know, um, create changes in our communities um, and ensure that those changes are sustainable. Um, de nuevo, termino con resaltando la importancia de no tener miedo en utilizar sus voces, eh, sus posiciones, no importa en dónde trabajan, dónde viven. La verdad, ahorita es el momento para, para tomar estos, estos puestos de, de liderazgo a traer cambio. Muchas gracias. Eh, estamos aquí para apoyarlos eh, y espero de este, escuchar de ustedes, pero de nuevo felicidades por tomar este paso, ¿no? O de este, por lo menos pensar en, en servir en la mesa directiva del agua. Once again, thank you so much and uh, congratulations for listening in and considering sitting on a water board. Um, so thank you so much and we're here to support you. Gracias, Leti. That was wonderful and um, very inspiring as well. Again, um, thank you very much. And we really appreciate for you and all of the panelists here this wonderful Saturday morning to be able to share your experiences with our community members from the greater San Joaquin. So next, I'd like to introduce to you again, Dr. Federico Castillo, who will be speaking on the principles of environmental justice. Dr. Castillo, go ahead and share your screen and unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Espe. And once again, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate the invitation uh, from the board. And I'm delighted to be uh, sitting, uh, as it were, next to uh, people who have a long, long, long uh, uh, trail, if you will, have left a long trail of environmental justice and equity. I want to, uh, I'm gonna share my screen. I did prepare a few slides in Spanish and English. I will make them available to you so that you can post them as you, as you, as you think appropriate. Uh, so I'm gonna do that. Let's see, uh, this one here, this one here. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, thank you. So uh, it, there are really only four slides because I thought that I was going to do the Spanish English business thing, but uh, since it's going to be only in English, uh, I am I'm going to extend a little bit uh, on the issue here. Uh, so uh, you need to understand that uh, you know I am I work at a university, uh, I do research, um, and I'm going to talk about uh, uh, and then for me information is very important, where it comes from, the veracity, the accuracy, uh, what is the information being used for, right? So most of us, or some of us, write papers and reports and this and that, uh, but also some of us use information to engage communities on different issues. So uh, with that background, uh, I would say also that I hold water issues dear to me on a personal level. I was an undergrad at the University of California at Berkeley working for a faculty member there who is an agricultural economist. And uh, I was basically doing a lot of, you know, office work, uh, you know, taking care of correspondence and whatnot. And so one summer he says to me, what are you doing this summer, Federico? And I say, I need a job. And he says, well, I'm doing research on the impact of drought on California agriculture, and we're doing a survey. Do you wanna work with me on that? And I say, absolutely. So there was like a 10 people working on that, uh, about six students, uh, all of them PhD level. I was the only undergrad, but that was how I got hooked <laughs> on agricultural economies. I got hooked on agricultural economies through water and looking in particularly at irrigation systems in California agriculture. I have evolved from that uh, a little bit, uh, but still uh, keeping that in mind, and I will mention this in the context of uh, diversified farming systems. Uh, so anyways, as I was teaching at Cal Berkeley, uh, and I will be teaching again this fall, I have not teaching, I've not been teaching for the last three years, but uh, I noticed one important thing, and that was uh, when I was teaching uh, immigration classes, there were a lot of Latinx students sitting in front of me. 
But when I taught a class on environmental economics and agricultural economics, there were none, zero Latinx students sitting in front of me. And so I start wondering why was this dichotomy, if you will, this asymmetry? And so I start looking at enrollment around campus of classes generate, uh, dealing with ethnic studies, the history of migration, immigration, and so on and so forth. And I noticed that definitely there was a huge gap. We did not have students, Latinos and Latinas students choosing environmental related majors, meaning environmental economics, forestry, environmental health, conservation biology, uh, and so on and so forth. And so uh, environmental engineering, and so it's not that they were not there. It's just that out of a 25 student class, you will get one or two. Furthermore, when I went to professional conferences, I found out that, hey, there were a lot of people talking about environmental equity, environmental justice, but they were not Latinx people. They were, and, 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 and you know, somebody has to talk about this. There were people with the best of intentions analyzing the environmental justice issues related to climate change impacts, uh, clean air, clean water, and so on and so forth. But we were missing in action. We just basically were not there. And so I took to talk to some people and we uh, invented, and Esper, you are well aware of what our journey has been, uh, Latinx and the environment. Latinx and Environment is an initiative in campus that we attempt to bring together, um, uh, we attempt to bring together uh, researchers, people like me, other faculty members, lecturers, students who are the future, I believe, and I'm sure we agree on that, and community-based organizations and policymakers. And I feel that if we were to bring these three stakeholders under one umbrella, we will be able to change the trajectory on many of the issues that matter to Latino communities and uh, in regards to environmental quality, water quality, the impact of extremes, droughts, wildfires. Uh, and so we start sort of concocting this initiative, right? Uh, I knew where I was going. I didn't know who the partners were. I found a, a great partner, Lupe Gallegos Diaz, uh, who for full disclosure is my sister-in-law. So uh, we kind of start having conversations how to bring this about. And so uh, wh one, of the, one of the things that we say is, we're going to get a students to do research because Latinx students at Cal Berkeley at least, do not have the same opportunities that other students have. Let me rephrase that, please. There are opportunities for all students at Berkeley. It's not that Berkeley say Latinx students cannot participate in this research opportunity, uh, uh, just to be clear. But the channels of information were not there. So for example, if there was a particular research funding opportunity for undergrad students, and I serve as a reviewer of some of these proposals for students to do research on environmental related fields, I would be reviewing uh, proposals with all the Smiths and Jones, and, and to be honest, and they were not either African Americans or Blacks, and there were no Latinx students applying for this research. And I honestly feel that if we are missing on this issue, then we will not be able to have a future in terms of impacting policy, impacting the science, and the relevance of the questions that we ask. So with that in mind, we start recruiting students to participate in Latinx and the environment. Uh, we start uh, having seminars, uh, panels, conferences. We had a uh, Latinx and the environment summit. We have had two of those. Last year, we had a big event in Mexico City, um, uh, connecting 
brothers and sisters from Mexico to Latinx in California, talking about border issues and, and students, in particular students. We are student-centered, that's what we do. That's one of our major products at Berkeley. We do research, we publish, we're known for that. There's quite a few Nobel Prizes in all kinds of fields and, and, and so on. But also, uh, students is what we do. We form students. We send people out to the world after they have spent some time with us. So we want to make sure that the students are part of the talk conversation. And then community-based organizations uh, are the ones that have a lot of information, uh, but is not taken by the research sector. I'm sure there are exceptions. Uh, I met some people at Fresno State, for example, who do a lot of good work, uh, groundwork, talking with community-based organizations. I know people at UCLA who do it. But again, the lack of Latinx, the presence there is just not, is just not strong enough. So I'm going to provide you with two examples of how we are empowering students uh, who are the future uh, to talk about environmental issues. Uh, one of them slightly related to water. Uh, and the other one, it was just be sort of a plan how to do this and actually how we're going about this. Uh, one project that we have is uh, heat waves. The impact of heat waves on agricultural labor. Uh, you know, I don't need to tell you that temperatures due to climate change uh, and the increase, uh, you know, concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is increasing over time. That has been a steady increase, but uh, there is also the fact that we had, we get these outbursts of temperature increases called heat waves that impact mostly people who work outdoors, people who work in the agricultural field and, agri and, and construction. And it goes without saying that, that those folks are mostly Latinx. So uh, we partner uh, with a few researchers from Arizona State, from UC Santa Barbara, and we design a project where we are currently waiting for COVID and to get the clearance to um, uh, do field work, do uh, 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 interviewing farm workers. We already have done some of this, but now we're doing a random sample and so on and so forth. Uh, why does it matter? Because the stakeholders in this project are community-based organizations too, one of them being uh, Body Lib. Some of you know Ray Leon. Ray has been a good partner, a great partner to have uh, for us. The geographical area is Huron, Avenal, Pualinga. And this means that uh, Ray knows this area well. Uh, San Jose, Bali Lib, uh, sorry, uh, Bali Lib, excuse me, uh, Bali Lib is extremely familiar with the zone. They have information with the area. They have information we don't have, and so we partner with them. Not only the reason that we partner with them is because we feed on the information they have on the focus groups that we do, and we ask questions that are relevant to the communities. Not just good to publish. You know, we all want to publish in journals uh, that most people don't read, but uh, that, that's how we get paid. Uh, uh, but uh, more importantly, the angle or the view or the, the question, the way the question is framed is very Latinx relevant. Second, of course, we have, uh, besides uh, community-based organizations, we have the faculty uh, who are experts from their own field. This is a very multidisciplinary effort. Uh, Jennifer Vanos out of Arizona State is an expert on the impact of heat on children and on agricultural workers, you know, more on the sort of health, medical uh, outcomes field. Uh, we have David lopez Carr, who is a geographer, and then myself uh, in the field of economics. And between the three of us, uh, we pair with Ray Leong and others on the field, uh, Veronica Aguirre and others, who uh, again provide an excellent part, uh, an excellent, who are excellent partners in conducting the work. More importantly, we include students uh, in the project. Every single project we do include students. Uh, we try to place the students in 
positions where they can generate information, uh, assist us and be part of the research team uh, in terms of framing questions, developing hypotheses, proposing how the field work is done and so on and so forth, because that empowers the students to either when they go to graduate school, they already have a different vision or whether they go to work for the government, for the private sector, or for a nonprofit or a community-based organization, they already have knowledge that they can use. And so we feel the research is power, uh, again, because this is a university setting, that's one way for us to empower students. Uh, you know, the other day, not the other day, uh, about a year ago, somebody said to me, well, but you know, you only have Latinx students. And I say, yeah, and I, that's okay for me because we are missing the action in terms of Latinx students participating in research and collaborating with the communities. Uh, the other thing that I wanna say is that in our uh, effort, we have students from a whole variety of, of, of majors, from poly science to environmental engineering to conservation biology, environmental health, environmental economics and so on and so forth. So it's not that we are concentrating only on the economics or the poly science or the history. We have a history major as well. And now this semester we have placed 17 students uh, who will be participating in research and with community organizations. It's both, it's not one or the other. It's not that we want them to do research at a library only. No, they have to do research go and talk to the community organization partners, community-based organization partners, and the policy makers, right? Uh, and then have a more holistic approach to uh, the environmental issues that they face. Some of them work in their work in their own communities, and some of them don't. Uh, and uh, so these are 17 students that I can safely say will not have a chance to do this kind of work. Uh, these students uh, uh, that will not have had this to do this kind of chance to do this kind of work uh, had we not been there providing the opportunity for them. Uh, these students are future leaders, future graduate students, future PhDs, future faculty. And so we're not trying to change. This is like a, you know, uh, a slow moving tanker making a U-turn in the middle of the ocean. We understand that, but you know, we, we, and we partner with others who have similar ideas, by the way, particularly those who are part of the STEM processes. But STEM, again, is very academic. There is very little component on the community participation. Uh, and so we try to add value to our experience on that. Um, I will then uh, say that this Heatway project is a good example of what we do. Uh, Heatwave has a water equity issue. Uh, well, first of all, Heatwave has a phenomenon, and we're not going to get into climate change science here, is related to the hydrological cycle uh, in a very sort of scientific -y way, if you will. Uh, but also, Heatwaves have a very uh, important equity and environmental e uh, justice issue in regards to access to water while people are is working. Uh, we all know there are regulations related to this. And so one of the pieces on the research that we do is how these regulations are enforced, how these regulations are often observed and implemented. And by the way, we're working with farmers too. Uh, we interview farmers whenever they are willing and sit down with us sometimes. It's difficult as you can imagine, but some of them do. Uh, and, and, and we also interview labor contractors uh, so we tried to get a whole picture on this. Uh, uh, in terms of water, this is just an example of, uh, of how we intend. There are actually, and SP might correct me, there are actually three interns working with her or two. Uh, and SP has provided yeah. us uh, with funds for students to do research this year we got a little bit sidetracked because of COVID. The university basically has prohibited us to go and do field work. Our initiative is very field work oriented, if you will. So this, this year we were going to provide the students, 10 students with knowledge as to how to use gadgets that measure water quality 
and then how to use GIS skills and global positions, GPS information to look at how this water quality is located relative to where Latinx neighborhoods are. And this will have provided information to policymakers and community-based organizations when they go to Sacramento and they need to quantify this. Now, let me say this, it's not that this information is not being generated. There are many veterans here, Connor in particular, who knows, for example, this information has been available, but information generated by and for Latinx is, is the issue here. And so we wanna make sure we empower our students uh, with the ability to generate information and use the information, they're the future again, so we do that. So the question, for example, you usually get this, this water, this map that you see here. Now the proportions vary, you might have an argument as to it's really 62 versus 65, whatever, in terms of each sector that uses water. And so this is what a student will see in a water economics class, for example, right? Uh, I was uh, a teaching assistant for a class at Berkeley called water economics for two years, so uh, for three years, three semesters. And this is what we will show them and we'll say, well, this is the water used by each sector, blah, 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 here we go. And then we move on to look at, for example, uh, the relationship of how agriculture uses its water, how the urban uses, sector uses its water, water saving measures, changing the water tank capacity to one gallon and all the, and the irrigation systems, drip versus, uh, drip versus, um, uh, you know, furrow irrigation versus uh, aspersion uh, systems and so on and so forth. But that was very silo-like. We are Latinx and the environment, we want the students to look at this graph and ask themselves, okay, so, how can how is urban water interrelated to agricultural water? How does lobbying changes these these parameters? What are the quality issues related to water? And I think Amarta spoke uh, fluently about this. I'm not going to reinvent the wheel here. So what we at Latinx and Environment would provide is a student that will help to connect the dots across sectors, across levels and deal with the equity and the environmental justice issues that are related to water in this particular case. Uh, we were going to do that this summer. Unfortunately, we have to divert the students to other activities in terms of measuring water quality and so on and so forth, uh, and, and working with community-based organizations because they cannot go, right? Uh, we are asking them to do this work. But uh, this will be one example of how we at Latinx and the environment promote the research and actually kind of we tell the students that engage with us if you are not willing to think outside the box if you are a poli science major but you're not willing to sit down with a say for example either an agricultural worker a farm with farm labor uh to do to talk to them about how how water impacts him or her or if you're not willing to sit down with an, an, economy, an economics major student or with a faculty who deal in economics, then we probably are not for you. We need you to think outside the box. We encourage the students to move beyond their major and many of them, and some of them have even now done minors, right? So, oh, I was a history major, now I'm gonna do a minor in conservation science, for example. Uh, and so, this will be the sort of framework that we use in environmental justice with our uh, institution. And just in closing here, uh, to close is to forge partnerships is the key to information. We believe information is it. You know, when you show up to, and, and again, this is not that we don't show up to Sacramento or to city council meetings or to the Berkeley City Council or Richmond City Council, ignorance about the information. We, know, we already know. We already know the number of particles uh, per million, uh, the million particles per unit in the air. We already know. We can map now aquifers and tell exactly what pollutant is moving from where to where. But it is the who and it is the how the information is proposed. And we feel that by empowering members of the community and partnering 
uh, research uh, students and community-based organizations, there will be a more holistic approach and more effective messaging. Why? Because uh, the relevant research questions need to be asked. Uh, let me provide you with one example. Uh, if you recall the wildfires that took place uh, in Northern California two years ago, the Bay Area air was foul. The number of asthma cases grew exponentially uh, and so on and so forth. Um, very few people <laughs> talk about the people, the Latinx who were working at the vineyards. What's going on with these folks? How are they being informed about the consequences? Some of them continue working while the wildfires were nearby. I'm saying five kilometers or five miles or whatever. And so they did a, a, a workshop, a day long workshop in campus about wildfires. And then they did breakout sessions. And I participated in the environmental equity uh, and justice session as it relates to wildfires. And in that session, there were 12 of us in this breaking out group, in this breakout group, there were not a single leader, African American, black, or Latinx person. Everybody spoke about environmental justice and how wildfires impact workers and so on and so forth. But we were not there. And so my point to them was, where are they? You know, there were government people there, there were a couple of nonprofits and so on and so forth, but where are they, right? Uh, we did not invite them. I, know I was not part of the organizing team, but uh, uh, so I registered for the workshop. It was an all day workshop. And at the end of the, uh, and so we spoke about uh, how to do a Spanish translation of documents and how to uh, do early warning systems for Latinx people in Spanish on the radio stations. They, everything was talked about. At the end of the day, the organizer came up to me and said, you know, uh, Federico, you have a point. Can you organize a session where we talk about wildfires with Latinx partners? I know you know some people. Uh, I know you know students, faculty. And I know you have some, uh, you know, some community-based organizations. I say, sure, no problem. So we organize uh, about a half a day uh, uh, where we brought some people to campus to talk about wildfires and environmental justice issues. Guess what? The question asked was the same. How do we minimize the impact of wildfires on Latinx people? But the way, the proposed ways to go about informing Latinx, uh, reducing the impact, what policies help, was very different to what was said at the workshop. And the reason is because here now we're talking with folks who know the communities, they have been there for a while, they have a long history there, uh, they know how food bank, well, you know, uh, food banks work, and so on and so forth. And so we gathered information that was very different from what happened at the main event uh, a month before. So this is one good example of how the relevant research questions and the relevant policy, policy questions change dramatically, at, at least at our level, university level, uh, uh, when you include other stakeholders and when you are asking the right people uh, to ask the questions. And we feel that once these relevant questions are asked, then environmental justice and equity moves forward to a better outcome. I'm not saying it would be an extremely well outcome, but we feel that if the right question is asked by the right people with the right knowledge, uh, then environmental justice and equity will be, outcomes will be improved. So. I will stop there. I think I went longer than expected. I appreciate it. I do have the PowerPoint in, in English but in Spanish, but I am just going to send it to you, Espe, so you can post it. Okay. Um, right. So uh, that's that. Thank uh, you very much. I'll be happy much. to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Yep. No, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, we greatly appreciate that. Those were very powerful slides that you provided, la información igualmente. 
and um, we will be posting all of this, you know, moving forward, like we said, on the um, social media and on the county's website. So, um, you know, very motivated here. We have um, folks probably that want to now, you know, move forward with their PhDs as a result of your presentation. So it's very exciting. And we also do want to, I want to follow up on what you stated with these students. Um, EJCW will have three of the Latinx in the environment students. We just did the interview process with them and we, um, they will be starting with us on Monday. So we will make that formal announcement. So we're super excited. They will be working on a lot of the um, virtual engagement that we've had to do due, due to COVID. So um, perhaps when everything has lifted, then we can move forward and they can help us with the well testing mm -hmm. as well um, in the future. But mm -hmm. we're super excited about um, the students, our um, Berkeley students that will be joining us. So mm -hmm. again, gracias. And, um, and we will, any questions, then just go ahead, uh, any of the folks who are participating, put the questions and we will have those um, answered at the end. And so um, I'd I'm like to- I'm gonna stop sharing the screen now. If okay. Yes, thank you. So we'd like to move forward and um, introduce to you our next speaker and um, our last live person, which is Andrea Leon Grossman. And Andrea will be speaking on how advocating leads the way for coastal justice and California's Ocean Day. So Andrea, if you can share your screen and unmute yourself. Hi, I'm trying to share my screen. Um, let me see. We see you. <laughs> and it looks really nice. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Diego, me ayudas? Share screen. Portion of my screen. Let's see. Okay, so while I work this out, let me just introduce myself. Um, so my name is Andrea Leon Grossman and I work with Azul. Uh, Azul is an organization, EJ organization that works to protect the coast and the ocean. Especially we work very, very hard to protect uh, industrialization of the ocean against that. Uh, that means that we work really hard on campaigns against plastics, against offshore drilling, and anything that builds off the coast, because we know that any infrastructure usually goes on uh, coasts that are mostly accessible to Latinos and other people of color. So um, that is one thing. And the other one is that I want to acknowledge that I um, have the pleasure and the honor to work with Marta, Connor, an SB in the past, and I have learned from them very, very much. And I'm looking forward to working with Leticia and Federico in the future. Um, I also want to acknowledge that, um, you know, the time that we're living in right now, and I want to quote Dr. Dr. Ayana Johnson. Uh, she just spoke yesterday on Ocean's Day with Greenpeace. And, um, and the time that we're living in, in terms of racism and how we have not made a whole lot of progress in the last 50 years is just uh, dumbfounding. And, um, and unless we tackle that, especially with environmental justice, we're not going to go anywhere. And as of today, just 49% of whites care about climate change. 57% 50, of Blacks care about climate change. And 70% 70, 70 of Latinx care about climate change. Imagine what would be possible if people of color didn't have to deal with racism and what could we devote to that energy to climate change and changing um, the world we're living in. 
So um, I think that's very important to acknowledge and uh, all, the, all the things that we can make happen. Um, it's very, I think it's very, very important. So um, I don't know if you could see my screen right now or. Yes. It's yes. the small thing. So I'm going to talk about water today and a lot of connections in terms of how we use it and how we misuse it. Um, as um, Martha Camacho was saying, a lot of people just expect the, the, you know, to open the water and a lot of times we just see the water coming out um, and it's, you know, if, it's, if it looks okay, it doesn't smell, we just assume that it's already good to drink. Uh, and she talked a lot about PFAS, um, and I don't know if most of you are familiar with what PFAS are, but that's a contaminant that is even more harmful than lead. And uh, it's been a tough some in the news, but not as much as uh, a lot of us would like to. And the problem with PFAS is that they bioaccumulate in the body and they can cause cancer and other illnesses. So- um, Do you see the full screen? Do you see this? Do you see my, my full screen right now? And in my um, yes, in my we're seeing the slide with the nearly seventy percent of the okay. world, and then Great. you're off Don't to the side. Now. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Okay. So, um, and and in terms of PFAS, again, the problem is that we is like that invisible killer right now that we have a lot of wells in Southern California that are contaminated by that, and we're doing almost nothing to to prevent. Uh, more PFAS to, for getting into the water and even clean up the ones that we have. Um, so um, I want to get into what what is going on with the world. <laughs> so as, as this slide says, nearly 70% of the water of the world is covered in water, but only 2.5% is fresh. And out of that, only 1% of our fresh water is easily accessible. So I'm going to get into what uh, do we have, or what are we doing with one, that 1% 1 of the water? So, because it's very uh, scarce, if you, if you look at the world, that's why we call it now the blue gold. And that's why we are going to be fighting the next wars over, these, uh, over the water that we have. Uh, one very common um, thing that I get is that, well, since there's so much water in the ocean, why don't we just get that water and desalinate it? Uh, and as Connor was saying, this is one of the biggest fights that we have. This is, desalination is the most expensive and energy intensive way to get fresh water. It kills marine life at the intake and with the leftover brine and chemicals, it kills even more marine life. Uh, it should always be considered as a very last resort. We always get uh, a lot of comments of, well, but Israel is doing it. But the thing with Israel is that if you look at the per capita consumption of water is almost a fourth of what we use here in the States. That means that they have gone through conservation and other ways of um, using their own water. And then they use desalination as really the last resort. Uh, this is again, very expensive to produce and it contaminates a lot. So we really need to see how we're using the, the water that we have and then you know, explore this, op this option as a very, very last way to get water. Oh, and by the way, when it comes to EJ, right now we're ha having this, this very tough fight with Poseidon, which is a, a corporation that wants to build a second desalination plant in Huntington Beach. They already built one in Carlsbad, and it has proven that this is a really, really expensive water. Every year, the, the plant in Carlsbad, it opened in 2015, the water keeps going up. Uh, and now the Poseidon one that they're trying to build, uh, there was a recent study by UCLA that proved that the rates will go up and it will affect environmental justice communities in Orange County. So um, it's really important that we really exhaust every and other way to source fresh water. And we know that there's conservation, there's recycling, there's stormwater capture, and a, a significant way of getting water that will give us good green jobs and, and good water that doesn't involve harming communities of color and the ocean. Um, also, it's very important to have uh, in mind what we're doing with the actual water that we have and how we're wasting it in, in horrible ways. 
So 80% of the water withdrawn in the U.S. is used for uh, power generation and irrigation. Um, and this is very important. Again, like Federico was saying in terms of how we're using it in like very ar arid areas and uh, how we're prioritizing our water in, in zones that maybe we shouldn't be planting a lot of um, crops, not only because the crops shouldn't be planted there, but also our own um, farm workers shouldn't be working in, under those conditions. So I think it's very, important that we pose that question. Um, and then also the amount of waste that we have because we're planning it there. And then a lot, the amount of waste that we have as a population in terms of food waste. So I think everything kind of goes hand in hand and, and we really need to make sure that we don't end up poisoning the water that we have. So what is the solution? Uh, if you look at renewable energy, uh, after the, um, the wind turbines are built or the uh, solar panels are, are manufactured, those sources of energy use little to no water. Um, and again, once you, you're, they're, they're there and they're installed, they're good for you know, another 30, 40 years or even beyond that. So we really need to make sure that we have those sources of energy that don't pollute and don't hurt our communities. Uh, I live in Los Angeles and that's the biggest urban oil field in the nation and it hurts our communities, uh, especially Latinx communities and, and black communities because that's where the oil was are right next to. And I know people who are having asthma and even cancer who live next to those oil wells. So I think we all deserve clean air and clean energy no matter where you live. Another solution is to have regenerative ag agriculture uh, because it's less water intensive and also pollutes less water. And that goes not only to you know, um, crops, but also um, animal agriculture. It's also uh, less cruel. So we really need to rethink how we're doing um, our food system and, and what we're doing with our own water. Um, a lot of the stuff that I learned, uh, besides learning from cool people like Connor, Martha, and Espy, I learned through watching uh, great documentaries like The Last Goal at the Oasis, um, Water and Power at California Heist, which is about how water rights were attributed in California. And uh, there's uh, a Netflix, it's called Even the Rain, which is a, a fairly um, old documentary, maybe like 10 years old, about uh, water fights in Bolivia. And that one is in Spanish and translated into English. So uh, those are really good uh, documentaries to watch. And also there's a small book, it's not too long, it's called Whose Water Is It Anyway? Um, and it's also about uh, water privatization and how we protect public systems. So I really strongly recommend those sources of information that anyone can um, tap into. Um, as soon as the libraries reopen, I think you can actually go to the library and check those out for free. Um, and uh, it's been a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you for having me. Gracias. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Andrea. That was very, very informative. And I especially liked at the end all of the um, reading materials that you made available for our community members. And um, we hope that everyone takes advantage and is able to follow up with regards to all of the resources that you have provided. And again, Andrea's PowerPoint will be made available on the website. And um, so the resources and all the information that she had. And um, Andrea is a full blown, complete activista. She's been featured on Univision. She actually um, lives by her word and lives in the green environment. And this is the reason that they have featured her on Univision um, because of the fact that her home in and of itself is an example of how she lives by the environmental um, component of her dedication to 
to doing good all around. So again, thank you, Andrea de Nuevo, for joining us and, and providing your wisdom, knowledge. Um, so we look forward to um, continuing this conversation um, at the end when we have our Q&A. So um, next, we have Kenny who is going to post the video for our last speaker whom I had stated earlier is um, the um, John Holbrook who is the chair of the Greater San Joaquin Regional Water Coordinating Committee. And he's going to talk about the component that has to do with the folks in the audience who will be joining the task force with the, um, the coordinating committee. Hello, my name is John Holbrook. I am a member of the board of the South San Joaquin Irrigation District. Today I'm speaking to you on behalf of the Greater San Joaquin County Coordinating Committee. As the chair of the Coordinating Committee, I'm here to introduce you to our Regional Water Management Group. The Greater San Joaquin County Region is one of 50 regions recognized by the California Department of Water Resources. Our region covers 971 square miles and includes major cities like Stockton, Lodi, and Manteca. The Coordinating Committee was created to pursue integrated water resource management projects. Members of the committee actively participate in meetings to discuss water projects, grant funding opportunities, and provide input on key documents, such as the Integrated Regional Water Management Plan 2020 update. The committee is a collaborative effort focused on water management. The coordinating committee strives to reach consensus among its diverse membership with valuable input from the public. The coordinating committee was formed through a memorandum of understanding and utilized a decision-making charter. Organizations with an interest in integrated regional water management can sign the memorandum of understanding and become a member of the coordinating committee. Currently, there are 11 member organizations. We meet on the third Wednesday of each month. We have a challenging schedule ahead. We are preparing the 2020 Integrated Regional Water Management Plan update and are actively seeking projects to be incorporated into the plan. Ultimately, the goal is to secure state funding to support implementing water projects in our region. Our region has secured $6.5 million in grant funding from Proposition 1, which was passed by California voters in 2014. We anticipate the California Department of Water Resources making this money available to our region in 2021. Of the $6.5 million, $900,000 has been earmarked for water projects that directly support and benefit disadvantaged communities. Successfully building water projects with this grant funding will hopefully spark additional funding for our region. The coordinating committee is supported by a project management team that includes professionals with expertise in engineering, planning, permitting, and community outreach. In 2020, we are teaming with the Environmental Justice Coalition for Water to conduct important outreach to disadvantaged communities in our region. In doing so, our hope is that we can build a disadvantaged community task force to give underrepresented and underserved communities a voice on the committee. If you are interested in joining the Coordinating Committee or DAC Task Force, please visit our website or give us a call. I look forward to working with you and seeing you at future Coordinating Committee meetings. Thank you for your time and involvement. So again, that was John Holbrook, and he was the speaker that we had from the 
Greater San Joaquin Regional Water Coordinating Committee. And he's on the board of directors there representing division five of the irrigation district. And he was actually born in Compton, California, and he was raised in Manteca. And he retired from the US Navy as a senior chief boatswain mate after serving 28 years. And um, he's also, just a side note, a French Camp Hall of Famer. And so again, um, any folks that are going to be joining us as part of the um, task force, John will be able to help with any questions that they may have in the future. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna enter into the, um, the questions and see what our audience members have for the panelists. So let's see. Um, we had a, we had asked answered this, but we'll go ahead and let you know again. So there was a question about the bios and the recording of the coordinating um, of the of the webinar to be posted on the website. And so yes, the um, the bios of all of the panelists are currently available on the um, social media platforms, but we will be posting them on the website and um, we will be posting the actual webinar itself after the translation has taken place to um, ensure that we have both English and Spanish um, posted on the website. And um, in terms of, there's another question and this will be made to, um, to the county, to John's group, whom um, they'll have to answer this at a later time, about a comment of the safety of drinking water in the Eastern San Joaquin Subbasin. Um, I don't have the name of the person who's this attendee, but um, we will we'll go ahead and answer that question. We'll send that over to the county for, um, for information because I do believe it depends on the area, but in terms of we, we haven't been alerted to any um, safety issues as of yet. And um, we have a question here from, um, from Cynthia Lau. And so it's, um, Marta, this uh, question is for you. If you have um, 30 contaminated wells in your community with 300 contaminated wells throughout California, do you know how many wells in San Joaquin and how would we find this information? So I'd, if you can answer that, Marta, if you can unmute on how you found out your wells, how they were contaminated. Uh, so uh, the area, <clears throat> excuse me, the area that I reside in uh, uh, under the Central Basin Municipal Water District, so we have access to information about specifically our region and how that contamination happened. So um, that's how we got alerted with the contaminated wells in our area. Um, you can go on to the California, uh, oh my gosh, I'm like drawing a blank right now, the State Water Resource Board, and they have a GIS that maps the PFAS in California. And I'll send a link. Yes. Okay, yeah, thank you. We'd appreciate that. That way, if we have any folks in the audience who um, need assistance as to where to find if the wells are contaminated or not, those links would be helpful. And then we'll go ahead and post those. But thank we you. have a couple more questions here. Thank you again. You're welcome. The next question. Move this down. Oh, here we go. Okay, here's the question for Connor. How is um, usage of water per person? calculated and what accounts for such a huge discrepancy in usage between Australia and Israel? So um, the calculation in California is calculated by the total production of water, the 
divided by the population. So it includes all sources, um, both residential, commercial, industrial, and institutional uses of water, and um, any agricultural if there is in the area. The separate number that's used often that looks much better, which is just residential number. Um, the difference between California and the rest of the um, world, really, but other countries that I mentioned, Israel, Australia, Spain, is that they realize it's a finite resource, and they, um, Israel intended irrigation in the 50 um, other areas have always had restricted use of water. They capture water through cisterns. Can other I have uses these in the bag? These are restricted, two? and they also make use of um, stormwater and other programs that we're really just beginning to do. The other big piece of it in Israel, they use almost 90% of all their recycled wastewater is used for irrigation. Um, we are at about uh, eight to ten percent in the state, so we have a long ways to go in all the ways we can uh, start to use less and be far more efficient in the state. Thank you again for your response, Connor. We have another question, and this question is directed to Dr. Federico Castillo. How were you inspired to get into this field of study that you're currently in? Uh, well, uh, thank you for asking. Uh, I grew up on a farm. Uh, I am from Costa Rica originally. I grew up picking coffee. At seven years old, I was already out there uh, picking coffee. That's not true. As kids, they put us to pick a coffee from the ground so that nothing is wasted. So that's what we did. Uh, and of course, you know, I, I grew up uh, again uh, in sort of a semi-rural area. And then when I came to the US uh, quite a few years ago, I again was asked to work on a project by a faculty member. And that's exactly what inspired me to work with the students as well. If this faculty member had never asked me to work on a irrigation related, agricultural irrigation related project during a summer uh, related to the drought in 19, I think it was a 1994 drought, um, I would have never, it would have never occurred to me to engage in this kind of research. And that was the kind of mentorship that you needed uh, to engage. And so hence, uh, I think that, that has served me as a model uh, uh, to uh, engage with the students, to give them an opportunity, not just to do agricultural economics, but all kinds of uh, aspects of environment, environmental law, environmental engineering, and so on and so forth. So that's exactly what just sort of got me going into the field of agricultural economics. I love visiting farms. I was just told, uh, as, a, as a matter of another angle, I wanted to say that I'm working on a project. This is related to what Andrea was speaking earlier about. I, I don't know what she called regenerative agriculture. I'm working on something similar that is called diversify farming systems. And diversify farming systems have to do with the fact that there are farmers who grow either several crops at once or, uh, or sequential cropping throughout the year, not just the monocrop system that we often see. Uh, we know that those systems tend to use less water. It kind of varies depending on the crop, but they do tend to use less water. And uh, there is quite a few uh, Latino farmers uh, using this system. And so it is important for us to recognize uh, that there is also the issue of Latino farmers. They tend to have much smaller farms and they operate uh, really on a different scale, but uh, nevertheless is something interesting to study and to ask the questions, for example, why they don't uh, adopt certain irrigation systems? What are the obstacles for them to adopt uh, less water intensive usage irrigation systems and so on and so forth? So what motivated me was first, I grew up on farms. Second, um, 
I was asked for a faculty member and I have always continued to be motivated by asking different questions uh, in terms of agriculture in California and, and Mexico as well, where I have done some work. So thank you for asking, yeah. I hope again, that answers the question. <laughs> thank you again for um, your response. Yes, I believe so. We also now have a question for Andrea. Andrea, are there any organizations or efforts that we can get involved with on the Central Coast or North, North Coast to assist in ocean conservation that you would suggest? Yes. So, um, of course, we actually have a new campaign called uh, Latinos Marinos in the sense that we want to have chapters throughout uh, the country. So that way, um, everyone can start their own chapter wherever they are, and, and we can supply them with their tools that they need to make sure that they know about conservation and, and beach access and what the rules are for each state, because they vary. Uh, in California, we have the Coastal Act, which means that all beaches are, are public, with the exception of a couple, which uh, mostly uh, military bases. So we, um, that's what we advocate for. And, um, and we also have, and this year unfortunately was canceled because of the coronavirus, we have a yearly event where we go to Sacramento and SB has been with us uh, there, where we um, go and we advocate for um, the, the rights of people of color to have access to the ocean and any other issue that um, is really bugging anyone who goes there with us. Um, so yeah, if we were very excited about um, having this um, Latinos Marinos um, campaign being rolled out and make sure that, you know, everyone can have the tools they need to make sure that they can be a good advocate for um, people of color and the ocean. Thank you very much. And then um, again, just to reiterate what the work that Azul does and that Andrea has done in, in organizing the Latinos Marinos um, Advocacy Day in Sacramento, it is you know something of value. And then for those of us that are inland, it is most definitely important in terms of our connectivity to the ocean to participate in such events, especially because it's very specifically geared towards um, us having a voice as environmental justice community members and advocates in Sacramento. And Azul does pave the way for us to be able to do that on that day. And those, those numbers that we have are strength in numbers. So again, thank you for that, Andrea. We have a question for um, Leti. Well, we have two questions for Leti. They're similar. So Leti, you can see how you want to tackle both of them. So um, let's see, working in the Central Valley, what are the challenges you face in working with the Latino community and getting them involved in philanthropic efforts? And the other question is for you that says, how can we as people of color gain access to capital to help our communities when we don't know people with funding? Most people I know are just, are just broke. Excellent questions and thank you for asking them, um, Cynthia and Arlene, appreciate it. That's the challenge, quite honestly. Um, and I'll go back to the importance of investing in the pipeline of um, Latinx, um, brown and black and other minority um, populations to really invest in their professional and academic opportunities. Um, and there is very few Latinas um, or other um, folks of color in philanthropy. And that's precisely why I intentionally did that transition. However, to be quite honest and transparent, um, it took about 20 you know, or so mentors and advisors and graduate professors and everyone in my board of advisors to really help me in this process um, because transitioning into um, philanthropy, especially a private foundation, um, there is extreme challenges in place, systemic and institutional. And what I would advise as we um, are in now entering these spaces, um, precisely in philanthropy, is that we have a moral obligation to also then pull up and invest in younger and other um, 
minorities that want to enter philanthropy. So what I've been doing just um, to answer the question is that I've been um, mentoring and femtoring um, younger, um, younger folks of color that are wanting to enter philanthropy, that are wanting to uh, unravel what is this as a career and how do you even prepare to enter a career that's been very close to our community, like closed off to our communities or um, not enough access. And so that's been one of the things that I've been d devoted to and dedicated to because uh, unless we built our own um, individual wealth and community wealth, then it's challenging um, to the question, I think, to Cynthia to, you know, ask people to give when they're barely, you know, trying to survive, especially during these moments. So what I would um, say is that definitely we have a lot more work to do. Um, in the philanthropy space, but for now, um, just advising for organizations to that are connected to um, foundations to really reach out to their philanthropic partners that are um, granting them funds and really have these like conversations around the importance of um, connecting them to other funders and building those bridges. So then the money is actually coming to our regions, but it is an extreme challenge and there, we haven't really um, solved it yet it's work in progress but many of us the few women of color in this space are really heavily advocating to ensure that we are um, hiring higher rates of, of more women of color in these spaces and that we're also opening the doors for others to enter in these spaces and have not just the opportunities to enter philanthropy but also have the support to stay in philanthropy but at the moment it, it's um it's an extreme challenge but um i think together we can definitely bring more investments. And so what some of us are doing is also thinking about um, creating investment opportunities like learning journeys. Um, so we bring some investors and um, funders to our region um, to hear directly from the organization on profits and then also hear directly from um, entrepreneurs or small businesses and such too. So that's something that we're working on, um, a separate hat that I wear on a community level, but stay tuned uh, for that as well too. Thank you very much, Leti, in terms of that insight and in terms of your question and your continued dedication and participation in the uplift of our communities, especially our marginalized communities here in the Central Valley. Um, so I'm sure that many of the participants will be um, you know, looking forward to continuous engagement and seeing what the future holds for you here in the um, in the Central Valley. So um, it looks like we've come to the end of our time. And we, um, if there are any questions that come forward from any of the participants, we'll get the, make sure to get those answered. And again, the, um, the entire webinar we will have translated and it will be made available on the um, county website. And um, we want to thank all of our distinguished panelists for their time, their dedication on this Saturday to be able to be here live to, for the preparation that they did with all of their presentations. And um, again, we, we really want to thank you for that. And if we could just, you know, I have a little quote that we can um, end on. Um, it's uh, on environmental justice. We have got some very big problems confronting us and let us not make any mistake about it. Human history in the future is fraught with tragedy. It's only through people making a stand against that tragedy and being doggedly optimistic that we're going to win through. If you look at the plight of the human race, it could well tip you into despair. So you have to be very strong. Again, thank you all for joining us and, um, and we look forward to continually sharing your information so that our community residents and interns can then move forward and join and be a part of the, um, the county task force. Thank you again for all the panelists and participants. Well, thanks again for thank having you. me and uh, I uh, have a great weekend and uh, keep up the good work. Gracias.